For nearly 2,000 years, the Oracle of Delphi was the most prominent religious figure of the ancient Greek world. Many believed the Oracle to be the messenger of the Greek god Apollo. Apollo was the god of light, music, knowledge, harmony, and prophecy. The ancient Greeks believed the Oracle spoke the words of the god, delivered his prophecies, whispered to her by Apollo. The Oracle of Delphi was a high priestess, referred to as Pythia, who served in the sanctuary of the Greek god Apollo. The ancient Greek Oracle served at the shrine built upon the sacred site of Delphi. Delphi was considered the center of the ancient Greek world. One story states that Zeus himself sent two eagles from the top of Mount Olympus out into the world to find the center of Mother Earth. One of the eagles headed west, the other east. They met in Delphi. It was then marked with an omphalus, or the navel of the universe. Ruins near Delphi have unearthed evidence that long before the first appearance of Pythia, there existed another oracle that worshipped the earth goddess Gaia. It said that Apollo conquered the land from the Mycenae and fought a giant python guarding the oracle's cave. He then chose a woman to be the new Pythia. The oracle was regarded as the most powerful woman of the classical period from about 1400 BC to 400 AD. So why was the Oracle of Delphi held in such high esteem and what made the Delphic Oracle so important? Many believe the Oracle could communicate directly with the Greek god Apollo, functioned as a, a vessel for delivering his prophecies. The peak period of this influence of the Oracle of Delphi was around 500 to 300 BCE. People at that time would come from all over the ancient Greek Empire and even beyond to consult with the revered high priestess. The Oracle would be consulted before any major state undertaking. Greek leaders sought out the advice of the Oracle before planting crops for the season or founding a new nation state, or beginning a war. The oracle would even dictate the day an army could attack. The oracle of Delphi was not the only oracle found in the ancient Greek religion. In fact, they were quite commonplace, as a normal, as priests to the ancient Greeks. Most of the time, these oracles based their prophecies on observed symbols, such as the way the wind was blowing. Others, like Delphi, were believed to be able to communicate directly with different gods that they served. However, the Delphic oracle was the most famous. Great leaders of ancient empires, along with regular members of society, made the trek to Delphi to consult the oracle. King Midas and the leader of the Roman Empire, Hadrian, are among those who sought the prophecies. According to the philosopher and historian Plutarch's records, those who sought wisdom of the Pythia could only do so for nine days a year. One day a month or nine of the warmest months. Originally, the oracle would only welcome visitors on February 7th, Apollo's birthday. The oracle of Delphi would give a prophecy for a donation. Those who wanted to get ahead in the queue could do so by making another donation to the sanctuary. The lack of a strict religious dogma associated with the worship of Greek gods also encouraged scholars congregate at Delphi 
and it became a focal point for intellectual inquiry, as well as the occasional meeting place where rivals would negotiate. Delphi became a fantastic showcase of art treasures, and all Greek states would send rich gifts to keep the oracle on their side. The path to the sanctuary, called the Sacred Way, was lined with these gifts and statues given to the oracle in return for a prophecy. Having a statue on the Sacred Way was also a sign of prestige for the owner because everyone wanted to be represented at Delphi. While the Pythia first prophesied from atop a simple rock on the site, a temple was eventually constructed that would house the oracle beginning in the 8th century. The temple at Delphi was built by priests of Apollo from Crete. The temple was built on the Delphic Vault. Initially, scholars believed that the Delphic Vault was a myth. It was actually proven to be fact in the 1980s when a group of scientists and geologists discovered that the temple ruins sat on not one but two faults. The temple was built on the site where two faults crossed. The crossing of these two faults would have meant that the site was prone to earthquakes, which would have created friction along the lines. This friction would have released methane and ethylene into the water which ran beneath the temple. Perhaps not coincidentally, there are also ancient stories that say these noxious gases were part of the ritual. During the nine days every year that the Pythia was to receive prophecies, she followed a ritual thought to purify her. In addition to fasting and drinking holy water, the Pythia bathed at the Castalian Spring. The priestess would then burn laurel leaves and barley meal in the temple as a sacrifice to Apollo. From ancient sources, we know that the Pythia entered a sacred room called the Aditon. The oracle sat on a bronze tripod seat close to a crack in the stone floor of the room. Once seated, the oracle would inhale the vapors escaping from that spring that ran beneath the temple. She then entered a trance-like state. According to Greek mythology, the vapors that the oracle inhaled came from the de decomposing body of the python who had been slain by Apollo. In reality, the fumes were caused by tectonic movements along the Delphic Fault, which released hydrocarbons into the stream below. The priests interpreted these prophecies or predictions and delivered the message from Apollo to the visitor. Some sources describe the oracle's prophecies as being spoken in a dactylic hexameter. This means that the prediction would be spoken rhythmically the verse would then be interpreted by the priests of Apollo and relayed to the person seeking the answer to a question. The prophecies the oracle provided often made little sense. They were reportedly delivered in riddles and usually took the form of advice rather than predictions of the future. This is very similar to how Nostradamus appeared in the 16th century. During the hundreds of years that the many Pythia made predictions at Delphi, several of these predictions were recorded by ancient scholars. There are cases in which the interpreted predictions seem to have come true. One of the most well-known early predictions of the Pythia was made about the founding of the democracy in Athens. A lawmaker from Athens named Solon visited the Pythia twice in 594 BCE. The first, visit, the first visit was for wisdom surrounding his planned capture of the island of Salamis. The oracle told him the following on his first visit. 
first sacrifice to the warriors who once had their home in this island, whom now the rolling plain of far Asobia covers, laid in the tombs of heroes with their faces turned to the sunset. Solon followed what the oracle advised and successfully captured the island for Athens. He again visited the oracle to seek advice about the constitutional reforms he wished to introduce. And the oracle told Solon, Seat yourself now amidships, for you are the pilot of Athens. Grasp the helm fast in your hands. You have many allies in your city. Solon interpreted this to mean that he should steer away from his current course of action and avoid becoming a rebellious tyrant. Instead, he introduced reforms that benefited the population. Solon introduced trial by jury and taxation proportional to income. Solon forgave all prior debts, which meant the poor were able to rebuild their lives. Solon required all magistrates to swear an oath to uphold the laws he had introduced and maintain justice. If they failed to do so, they had to build a statue of the Oracle of Delphi equal to their weight in gold. Another prediction that came to pass was given to the King Croesus of Lydia, now a part of modern day Turkey. In 560 BCE, King Croesus was among the wealthiest men in history. He visited the Oracle to seek advice about his planned invasion of Persia and interpreted her response arrogantly. The oracle told Croesus if he invaded Persia, he would destroy a great empire. Indeed, the destruction of a great empire took place, but it was not that of Persia. Instead, it was Croesus who was defeated. One of the most famous predictions made by the oracle refers to the Persian Wars. The Persian Wars refer to the Greco-Persian conflict between 492 and 449 BC. A delegation from Athens traveled to Delphi in anticipation of the impending invasion by the sons of Darius the Great of Persia, the venerable Xerxes. They wanted to receive a prediction about the outcome of the war. The oracle told them simply to retreat. The Athenians were unhappy with this response and they consulted her again. The second time she gave them a much longer answer. The Pythia referred to Zeus as providing the Athenians with a wall of wood that would protect them. The Athenians argued about what the oracle's second prediction meant. Eventually, they decided Apollo had meant for them to ensure that they had a sizable fleet of wooden ships to defend them from the Persian invasion. The oracle proved correct, and the Athenians successfully repelled the Persian attack in the naval battle of Salamis. The Oracle of Delphi was also consulted by Sparta, who Athens had called upon to help them in their defense of Greece. And initially, the Oracle told the Spartans not to fight, for the attack was coming during one of their most sacred religious festivals. However, King Leonidas disobeyed his prophecy. He sent a force of 300 soldiers to help defend Greece. They were all killed. At the Battle of Thermopylae, a legendary ancient tale. Though this helped ensure Greece's later victory at Salamis, which all but 
ended the Greco-Persian Wars. The Oracle of Delphi continued to make predictions until about 390 BC. The Roman Emperor Theodosius issued an edict that Christianity, specifically Nicene Christianity, the official religion of the Roman Empire, and he banned all pagan religious practices. Theodosius banned not only the ancient Greek religious practices, but also Panhellenic games. The last oracle spoke to a messenger sent by Julian the Apostate and returned with the following statement delivered in Hexameter. It reads, Tell the empire that the Didalic Hall has fallen. No longer does Phoebus have his chamber, nor antic laurel, no prophetic spring, and the speaking water has been silenced. After Theodosius' ban, the sacred way was ransacked, and the temples and statues were all destroyed. Eventually, Christian communities settled in the area, and in the 7th century AD, a new village called Castri grew over the ruins of Delphi. For centuries, Delphi was lost to the pages and stories of ancient history. It wasn't until the 1860s that a German archaeologist rediscovered Delphi. The site had been buried under a town. Today, pilgrims in the form of tourists still make the trek to Delphi. Although visitors may not be able to commune with the gods, the remnants of the sanctuary of Apollo can still be seen. Thanks for joining me today. I hope you enjoyed, and I'll see you next time.